Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking History. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're all keeping well. My name's Liz and on this channel we do exactly as it's called, I talk all about history. Before we get into the video, I just want to apologise if it's sounding a little bit echoey in here today. I went to run draw the curtain the other day and the whole curtain and curtain pole decided to fall off the wall and I haven't gotten around to doing it yet. So it will be done, but just bear with me. So I do apologise if it sounds a little bit easy in here today. So last week we finished off the Anglo-Saxon period with Margaret of Scotland. And if you haven't seen that, I will leave that links either up there or down there. It would be linked somewhere for you to go back and watch that one. And we are here. We have finally made it into the Norman period. We have got some real exciting things coming up and it won't be long before we get into the anarchy and then we get into the plantagenists oh i can't wait we got so much exciting i've got so many videos planned i cannot wait so if you are looking forward to all of that please don't forget to like and share and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos anyway let's get into this video today we're going to kick start the norman period who better than William the Conqueror? William was born in Falaise. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure. I will apologise about my pronunciations. They're not going to be really any good I was never any good at French or German for that matter I'm not really any good at any foreign languages so I do apologize so bear with me so he was born in Falaise in Normandy in 1027 and he was born to Robert the first of Normandy and his mother was Helene I think of Falaise and William was actually the result of an affair which would result in William being known as William the Bastard William had actually hated any disrespect towards his mother and the residents of Ellencon, which was a town on the border of Normandy, had mocked um, William's mother's father, so his maternal grandfather, his occupation as a tanner by hanging animal hides on their walls. So William avenged his mother's honour by having their hands and feet cut off. William also had two half-brothers, who was Odo of Bayo, the Bishop of Bayo, and Robert, Count of Mortain. When William was around eight years old, his um, father, Duke Robert, died whilst on pilgrimage, and William became Duke of Normandy in 1035. His father had actually secured the loyalty from his barons for his chosen heir. But due to William's young age and only being a child, he had a guardian who would rule in his name. And that man was Gilbert of Brion. But he would be murdered in 1040 when civil war had broken out in Normandy when rebel barons had looked to expand their own lands and it would take William seven years before he sorted out his dukedom but he did have a few powerful friends to help him mainly the Archbishop of Rouen and then in 1047 the rebels um, had suffered defeat at Felles Dooms um, which was near Cannes, and with the help of Henry I, who he was quite keen to protect the um, trade routes through Normandy. And there would be many more battles and many more sieges, and they would all end in success for William. Between the years 1050 and 1053, William had married Matilda of Flanders. Now, according to the legend, is that when William asked for Matilda's hand in marriage, she refused. She wouldn't marry anyone 
below her status. And William, who really hated being told no, had apparently tackled Matilda when she was on her horse. He pulled her down by her long braids and he'd beaten her in the street. Although this is very unlikely because the very first account of this story wasn't until after a hundred years after. So William and Matilda would have at least 10 children together and there was never any reports of any affairs or any illegitimate children being born outside of the marriage. And when Matilda died in 1083, it sent William into a deep, dark depression. William, who was once described as a strapping, young, healthy man, in his, you know, later on in life, he struggled with his weight and it was something that he was quite sensitive about. So when he was struggling, he'd come up with his own fad diets. And one of these fad diets would be where he would consume only red wine and spirits for a certain amount of time. And obviously this didn't work. And he was surprised it didn't work because he wanted to know why he didn't work. But there we are. So even then, even well over a thousand years ago, people were still wearing <laughs> all these fad diets. So over the next 20 years from 1047, there was a huge increase on power in the dukedom, but it wouldn't be without a struggle. And the years of war, they would train William in military strategies and he would become a formidable field commander. William would embark on campaign of war and expansion, especially against rival Flanders and Anjou. Now, William would use any method he could, whether it was torture, terror, mutilation, even marriage of political convenience to key members of his inner circle for William to become the most powerful noble in France. William was soon becoming unstoppable and he soon added to his dukedom over the years the Channel Islands and the Duchies of Brittany and, and Maine. And William, he didn't want to stop there. He wanted more. And he'd had his eyes set on the English throne. So... William couldn't invade England without any justification. And William had claimed that King Edward, Edward the Confessor, had named him as his successor. After all, he was family. He was Edward's second cousin. Count Richard I of Normandy was Edward's grandfather and he was William's great grandfather and so this was William saying well because I'm family he's named me as his heir but we all know the story uh, when Edward went on it was on his deathbed he had named Harold Godwinson as his successor instead so according to the Norman Chronicles in 1064, Harold had visited Normandy and he was captured by Count Guy of Ponthieu, Ponthieu? Um, who then handed him over to William. So William had put Harold to good use in battles to subdue Conan the Count of Brittany. Now Howard was on Howard was released on the condition that Howard had vowed to William that he was the heir to the English throne and Howard would um, prepare for the war of invasion, the way of invasion. 
So when Harold was crowned King Harold II of England in January 1066, William felt wronged. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles dispute any of this, but it was enough to convince others that William had the right to invade England. William had even received the blessing from the Pope and convinced that he had both right and God on his side. So William made preparations for invasion of southern England in the summer of 1066. I have covered the whole of um, the Battle of Hastings during my three videos on Harold Godwinson and the Godwins. So I will link those somewhere for you to see in case you haven't watched those yet. So William was lucky with his invasion on England as Howard uh, had recently faced another invasion just a couple of weeks before and William had, um, before William had arrived and this was the Battle of Stamford Bridge against Howard Hardrada and Tostig Godwinson who was Howard Godwinson's brother and they were both defeated on the 25th of September in 1066. So Harold and his army, army marched south to face William's army. Now the Battle of Hastings took place on the 14th of October in 1066. William had reinforcements arrived from Normandy and William marched on to London. He first took strongholds such as Romney, Dover, Winchester and Canterbury and many Anglo-Saxon nobles, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, swore allegiance to their new king. William was crowned King William I of England on Christmas Day in 1066 at Westminster Abbey, Westminster Cathedral, sorry. So King William continued fighting for a further five years before England had fully subdued. William scorched the earth and he built hundreds of castles. He had the rebels of Exeter and York imprisoned, tortured, mutilated. He saw two mini invasions from Ireland and a Danish force of East Anglia William distributed estates into the hands of loyal Normans and the church was reconstructed um, under Norman bishops who was getting the best jobs. New cathedrals were built such as Winchester, York and Canterbury and William had finally secured his new realm. Although William was King of England, he didn't ignore his lands back in Normandy. William frequently returned home, leaving England to be ruled by his half-brother Odo of Bayeux, who was now Earl of Kent. And there were times when William had to fight to keep his lands in France. Falk, who was Count of Anjou, had attempted to take Normandy in 1073, and Philip I, King of France, also had a go at invading Normandy and there was a failed rebellion in England in 1075 that was led by Ralph de Gaulle um, and this was actually put to rest without William ever needing to leave Normandy. In 1077 William's long-running military victories had come to an end. William was defeated near Dol in Brittany. Within a year, another rebellion broken out. And this rebellion was led by William's own son, Robert Curthose. And Robert had felt that his father hadn't given him enough power. So Philip of France decided to get involved and he took the opportunity to um, destabilise the situation and he gave Robert a castle on the border of Normandy 
um, for Robert to use as a base. William had attempted to siege the castle, but William had um, taught his son very well in the ways of war and William was defeated in a field engagement. However, father and son would be reconciled when Robert was needed to rebel the raids in Northumbria that was coming from Scotland in 1079. Now, William wasn't only a capable warlord, he was also a decent administrator. The king had ordered a comprehensive survey and record of all the landowners, the properties, tenants, serves of England in 1086 to 1087. And after the movement of from Anglo-Saxons to Normans, there was massive redistribution of estates and William was interested to know who owned what in his kingdom. And the findings of the survey would be assembled into a single document. And this document would become known as the Doomsday Book. And it's possible that the Doomsday Book was compiled for a new tax to be issued to ensure landowners provided the correct um, feudal military service that was expected of them. The record would then be also a very useful tool to ultimately pay for an invasion on England, which in 1087 was looking quite imminent. The Doomsday Book is the most comprehensive survey that was undertaken in a medieval kingdom. And it's a infallible insight into the aspects of daily life in medieval England. It has helped many, many historians over the years to understand medieval life. The Doomsday Book remains as one of William's greatest achievements and today it's kept in the National Archives in London. The invasion that everyone was fearing actually never materialised. Canute IV of Denmark, who was planning the invasion, had reasserted the claims of his family to England. Canute's father was King Swain II, Estrid, Swain Estridson, and Canute, along with Count Flanders and King Olaf III of Norway, had prepared a massive invasion on England. But before Canute could even set sail, there was a rebellion led by his own brother, Prince Olaf, who had opposed the high taxes and fines that was to pay for his invasion fleet and army. Canute fled the, rebel, the rebels, but he was captured and murdered, and the impending threat of invasion of England was gone. In early September 1087, William was attacking the town of Mantis in retaliation for their raids on Normandy when disaster struck. William's horse had reared up and this forced William into his saddle pommel and he was lunged into his saddle pommel so hard it ruptured his intestine. An infection quickly set in and William fell seriously ill. And about a week later, on the 9th of September, 1087, aged 59, William the Conqueror died. William was buried in St Stephen's Monastery in Cannes, which he and Matilda had built but his funeral wouldn't go smooth sailing. 
first a man had shouted out during the ceremony that the cathedral had been built on his father's lands without any compensation. Then a fire in neighbouring houses interrupted the procession and then to top it all, William was too big for his coffin. So when the priests and everyone around was pushing William into his coffin, they pushed, they pressed onto his stomach and his stomach exploded. And this filled the cathedral with a foul smell and people were throwing up, passing out and others ran out of the cathedral. It wasn't the really way <laughs> to go. After William's death, he had left his English kingdom to his second born son, William Rufus. His eldest son, Robert Curthoes, was to take over the family home in Normandy. Both William Rufus and Robert would struggle to keep their respective domains free from usurpers and ambitious nobles. England and Normandy wouldn't be ruled by a single monarch again until 1106 by Henry I of England, who was William's youngest son. William the Conqueror had lived an eventful life that was pretty much non-stop warfare and he was travelling back and forth between England and France. It's the subsequent, subsequent interlocking history of these two count, um, countries that we see William's greatest legacy, whether it's good or bad. By joining the two together, mixing the ruling elites, the increased trade and the political and cultural repercussions of William's conquest of England would be felt for centuries to come. After William's invasion, the whole of England changed. Everything changed, even down to the language. I will admit I am not the biggest fan of William, but I really, really do love the castles that he had built. And I imagine I'm not the only one that loves going around those castles. I am just in complete awe of their architecture and architecture architecture <laughs> and just everything about them but it's the history of them i'm not so necessarily just because it was built no no william the conqueror had them built i'm not saying that but it's the history that they'd been through the history to come who lived in them the future kings and queens to come that's what i loved about it Oh, and that's it for William the Conqueror. Tell me what you think of William the Conqueror. Are you a fan of his? You know, do you, do you, why is it? Also question me, that, question me this, answer me this. Why is it when everyone learns like the, the history of kings and queens, the royalty of England, why do we always start with William the Conqueror? Why does it suddenly begin at 1066? There was way before that. We proved it with the Anglo-Saxon period. Why does it always have to start with William the Conqueror? I think, I don't know whether history still taught in schools today. I know, well, my, my niece and nephews have left school now. They're older now. But I don't know whether we're still taught in high schools or not. And I think it, if it isn't, it should be. History is important. And there's much, much more history than just 1066. Anyway, 
that's my little rant and that's my little ramble so i hope you enjoyed the video thank you so so much for watching i really do appreciate it don't forget to like and subscribe and share so we can reach more history lovers like yourselves look after yourself i'll see you all soon take care